it is a joy to be with you in your new building. I know that you are excited. I've had the opportunity to follow on Facebook. Um, do you record that whole thing? Do you have to stay in there? Because I'm a walker. Is that going to mess you up? All right. Okay. All right. I, I can stay here. It just lit. I'll just carry the pulpit with me wherever I go. But, you know, being a part of this congregation and the growth has been wonderful to see how God has used you in all the different communities that you've been in. So when Mark asked me to come and preach, I'm just going to be honest with you. I forgot that it was Father's Day. I've already been at camp a month, okay? I moved to camp May the 20th, so holidays and all of that just go out the window when you're at camp. So as I was preparing my sermon, I thought, we are going to talk about the responsibility of a church because you as a new congregation, where you are, you have some incredible things going, but you need to remember, now that you're in a building, it's more about reaching out. See, Beth and I were in this kind of traveling church for a while, and once we got a building, now, don't you can edit this out. I think my church and the church that we were a part of, we got comfortable. We got a building, we've made it. But you haven't made it yet. You haven't made it until you've reached into this community, till everybody knows you're here, and everybody knows that you are here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then maybe we can label we made it. But our work <coughs> always, always goes. So just think about that. Pray with me, please. Father God, we just um, look at your word today that understand that it, it challenges us, that it gives us a vision, that it gives us a passion to serve you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who makes a difference in all of our lives. That's his name we pray. Amen. Amen. A few months ago, I had the opportunity, in April, I had the opportunity to go to Northeast <coughs> India and participate in the, and I have to read this because they say it a little different than the way, way we do, the 66th Annual General Meeting of the Council of Baptist Churches in Northeast India. So if you see this little map up there, there are uh, seven states over there in Northeast India. We have six Baptist conventions in Northeast India, okay? And in those conventions are 7,516 churches, 102 million baptized believers. So the reason that I go, and, and this was trip number 13 for me. Um, it's fun seeing Annette here today because she was on that first trip in 1999, and it was crazy, wasn't it, Annette? Uh, I mean, we just did everything, and, and it was all brand new culture. Now I can eat chicken and rice with my fingers, and I know how to do all of that stuff because that's their culture. But as you look at this, one of the things as a church you need to understand is what I did is I went to represent International Ministries of ABC USA, okay? And, and, and that's, the, that's the mission arm of who we belong to. That's the mission arm partly of the West Virginia Baptist Convention. So in 1836, there was these two guys named Nathan, or three, Nathan Brown, O.T. Clutter, and Miles Bronson. They made their way to Northeast India and started a work there. They, that this was a whole culture, a whole area of headhunters, and these people took the word of God there. Another thing they did wonderful is they took the word English there. So when I go, I don't have to learn a language. Now, most of the time, I, when I preach in churches, I have an interpreter, but just everybody can communicate in English. So when I'm training youth pastors, when I'm working with youth pastors, I can just talk West Virginian, and they understand it, you know? Um, so that's a beautiful part of well, this time they asked me to come and preach on living together in the household of God universal. And one of the things that I told them was, we've been living in the household of God universal since 1836, when somebody decided they were going to go from the U.S. all the way to Northeast India, fight through the jungles, fight through the mosquitoes, and the language barriers, and all of that, and preach the gospel. Now there are 1.2 million baptized believers because somebody had a passion, somebody had a mission to go. And that's still our responsibility today. As they asked me to come and teach and preach and talk about this household of faith universal, I just told them I have a simple model. Love God, love others, see where God's at work, and then we go join Him. 
And that's what you as a congregation are doing. You are trying to figure out how is God going to use you in this community? As you look at your surroundings now, it's a little different than cross lanes. But how can you make a difference here? You're still making a difference in cross lanes with the food drive, but you can also begin to look up and down Route 60 and, and, and all of these places to make a difference. The scripture that they gave me to talk about comes from Ephesians um, chapter 2, 19 and 20. And it says this, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Fellow citizens working together in the household of God. And that's what we are doing here today, and that's what all the churches are doing around the world, is they should be focused on Jesus Christ and glorifying him. And when you... Think about one of the, the realities we have to face, and, and, and if you haven't understood this, it just doesn't seem like people in America are on the same page, right? As, as, as we, like I said, I've been in Cowan for a month, so I'm not exactly sure, but I do keep getting this stuff about political things going on in our country. Is that right? And, and, and nobody seems to be able to agree. The problem is we as followers of Christ and we as the church of God don't seem to agree either. So we have to be able to demonstrate some things. And as the household of God, we just have the responsibility to have <clears throat> unity in the body. So we, you and this congregation need to have unity amongst yourselves. But we also need to have unity among other bodies of believers so that they continue to work together. In 1 Corinthians, um, chapter, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, Paul writes this. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so that there may be no divisions among you, and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. And let me just ask a couple questions. What have you done to bring unity in this body? And, I, and I, I'm kind of implying if you ask that question, what have you done to help unity? Maybe you need to ask yourself the question, what have you done to cause disunity? <coughs> it's a happy day, it's Sunday, but we all need to look and see what we are doing. What steps have you taken to be able to reach out and, and be amongst believers in, in this area, in the state, and in the world? And Jesus took this um, unity thing pretty serious. If you want to turn your Bibles to John chapter 17, we're going to hang out here just a little bit. I'll start in verse 20. And you'll see verse 23 a little bit on the screen. This is Jesus and, 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 and um, talking and he's praying for believers. And in verse 20 it says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. And, and I pulled this particular scripture out. As you look at this, verse 23, there's some incredible responsibility there. It says, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know. That's incredible responsibility in it because if we have disunity in here, if we have disunity amongst bodies of believers, then how is the world to respond? This is the challenge here. For us to hang on and understand what unity is so that the world will know, so that the world will know that Jesus Christ is the Savior and He changes your life, and He changes mine, and He changes churches. And I just dropped this little um, bottom thing on there as I misspelled protect. Um, Pastor Mark typed this up for me, so that's why I, said, uh, I just used his PowerPoint. But as you see that protect the reputation of others, think about even today, but more so tomorrow at work, tomorrow when you are in the world, if you have the opportunity to protect someone's reputation, do it. 
Do you guys know all the time when, when you are in business, you're not in school, but kids, you'll be hanging out with people and somebody will just say, well, I can't believe that Rob Ely did da 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 And you will have the opportunity to respond in one of two ways. You can agree with it or you can protect their reputation. If we want to be unified as a body of believers, then if we protect the reputation of others, then it demonstrates that we care and that we love. So when that opportunity comes, just take a deep breath and protect the reputation. Because you know what? Sometimes we even use the truth to hurt people. Don't. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm just telling the truth. But not everybody needs to know that. Let's demonstrate unity as we work on things, as we live together. Another responsibility as the household of God is that we have the responsibility to share the good news of Jesus Christ to a world that doesn't know Him. That's what the GF Challenge is all about, right? You need to be out there telling your story. And that's how, if you look at the, the story of the first disciples, if you want to turn in, in Mark chapter 1, um, and, and I'll start in verse 14. This is, this is the calling of the first disciples. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Point people to the good news. Challenge them to change their life and look towards Jesus. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And let me just draw some attention here. Because of the age of Andrew and Simon, they probably were not the brightest students. If they were, they would have already had a rabbi to follow. But Jesus finds them. They are there by the lake, tending their nets. And Jesus begins to look at them and say, Hey, you need to follow me. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. See, we need to understand that God and Jesus calls and uses normal people like me and you. It's not about education. It's not about all of these things. It's about a willing heart who dropped their nets and they got up and they followed Jesus right now. They didn't have to. I know I'm in a Baptist church and it's probably nominating committee time. But they didn't need to pray about things and take a month to figure out if God wanted them to do something. If Jesus wanted them to do something. When he said, come follow me, they left their nets and they followed him. Sometimes we need to be about the work right now. Fishers of men, how seriously do you take that calling? We all need to understand that there's this calling that God places on our life and we need to be about communicating the gospel. And I've probably used this illustration um, in this church before, but I, there was a point in time when, when I realized that I woke up in my Christian home, I went to my Christian office, I came back and I prayed with my Christian family, and I went home or went out in the evening and I played with my Christian friends, and I had no opportunity to impact the world. So I had to make a conscious decision to get involved with people who don't know Jesus. It was a great opportunity to start racing uh, mountain bikes and driving race cars and all of that. My wife didn't quite buy that excuse, but I thought it was awesome. <laughs> See, we need to find ways where we wade into the world where people don't know Jesus. We can get so comfortable. This is an awesome building, but this is not it. Changing and being out there and reaching into the world with the love of Jesus Christ is what we need to be about. We have that responsibility. And as you can continue your um, GF challenge, begin looking and praying that God will give you the opportunity to share what Jesus has done in your life. As a church, we have the responsibility towards discipleship. And I think that's how, yeah, we have the responsibility of discipleship. Colossians says, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that it powerfully works within me. 
You as disciples of Christ, as you are here, as you are involved in your small groups, as your home groups, you are being discipled. And we all need to be in those. As incredible as the sermons that are delivered here on Sunday morning are, it's not enough to just show up on Sunday, get two hours of church and go home. We have to be able to pick this up and work and talk and be taught. And then we have to have those conversations with people. And that's what home groups are about. We need to be about studying and praying. And I'll introduce a word to you as Baptist. We can even fast and pray. All right? That's where you avoid food for a little while. And the same time that you should be eating, that you should be preparing that food, that you should be buying that food, that you just sit down and take a deep breath and meditate on God's Word. That's part of discipleship, is reaching and seeking into God's Word. This whole idea of being mature disciples of Christ is where we need to be. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, Paul says a little different. To prepare God's people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach all unity. There comes back that word again. Until we reach all unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And when you think about disciples and men, those of you who stood up just a little bit ago, and those of you who have the desire someday to be a father, you want to talk about discipleship, listen to this verse, this, these verses. This comes from Deuteronomy 6. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. So first step there is it needs to be in here. Whatever word you read, however you live that out, it's got to be in your heart. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Why have we only limited discussing God's Word when we're in a church context? Why have we only done it when we're in small groups? See, this is the challenge when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. That means that God's Word needs to be present wherever we go. Making that a part of our conversation. But then it finishes out. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. If we are going to have the responsibility of discipleship for all of us and as a congregation, God's Word needs to be a part of that and value God's Word and value the guidance that it gives when we live by that. You know, as we think and talk about discipleship, one of the biggest challenges that all of us are having, the church across the world is having, whether I'm sitting in your business meeting, a business meeting for the Western Union Baptist Convention, or Northeast India, finances just seem to be an issue. So I'll just ask you the question. Is your giving matching your beliefs? Are you really sharing what God wants you to do? Because for some of us, we can't always go and do, but we can support people who go and do. And that's what the offerings that we give the church go about, is to be able to give people the opportunity to do mission and to serve God. And then I'll just ask, does your church challenge people to go? Because in my opinion, part of that being a disciple of Christ is serving Jesus. I think all of us can become incredible disciples if we learn the Word of God, and I love learning together. If we play, you just got to have fun. Hang out with Anthony and the youth kids, you will have fun, and then we got to serve. If you had the opportunity to serve, and I think we need to serve locally before we can go globally. You need to be able to do things in this community before you can get on a plane and go anywhere. Learning how to serve together. When, these, when we talk about mission, mission is giving witness to who Jesus is through the proclamation of what we believe lived out in our daily actions. Our daily actions of loving God and loving others. Mission takes place in the everyday and the ordinary. And that's what I had to understand is I was always looking at it as a program. But if mission is in the everyday and the ordinary, 
it makes a difference. And I put this on the slide so that you can understand that we as a church and you as a church are this mission giving station. The church becomes the foundation and anchor point for the continual retelling and celebration of the gospel story. Every day we need to have the opportunity to tell the story. The world, all of it becomes the context in which we live out the ongoing story of the gospel as participation in God's mission and ministry in the world. Look at your neighbor. Just, just take a glance. Look at your neighbor. Look the other way. Make sure you get both. God used and chose that person to communicate his word. All right? Now think about that. If Mark was here, I would say, God chose Mark. Are you kidding me? He could have done a whole lot better, right? And, and, and the same thing, every time I look in the mirror, God could have picked somebody a lot taller and a lot smarter than me to be able to communicate his word. But that's not what he did. He chose the crazy looking person sitting next to you and the crazy person sitting in front of you to do his work and to do his mission. Now, when you think about just, and Anthony already set me up perfect, you know, we in the West Virginia Baptist Convention have this little mission station in, in, in Cowan, West Virginia, you know, an hour and a half, two hours from here, where 1,900 to 2,000 kids will come through in the summer. Typically, 75 to 100 will accept Christ there during those, those 10 weeks that were out there. Last week, there were 14 kids who accepted Christ. That's just a small mission. That's just a small part of what you as a church contribute to by, by the money that you give, by the kids that you send us, and by the counselors that you send. That's an incredible way to demonstrate mission, to help them become mature disciples of Jesus Christ. And if we are going to become mature disciples of Jesus Christ, we've got to reach out to the needy. Still quite trying to figure out this how this comes, but in James chapter 1, verse 27, it says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. I just wrote in my notes, mission is not an elective course. It's not something you go, oh, well, maybe I'll do it, maybe I'll. Scripture is full of challenges for us to reach out and reach the needy. But see, sometimes we look at just, um, oh, we saw that homeless person there, and, and, and they are needy, and we need to reach out to them, and that's true. Oh, wait, uh, this person, their house burned down, and, and we, need to, we need to collect things, and we need to reach out to them. But the needy is much more than physical needs. It's the spiritual needs of people. And we need to begin to look and understand who that is. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus is with his disciples. And, and it's just been a crazy time for them. And he says, hey, we need to go away by ourselves and get some rest. For you teachers, that was last week when school was out, right? The next day, you're like, don't set the alarm. I'm just staying here. This is all about I need to be here. Accountants, it's April the 16th. Well, I guess it was the 17th this year since we can file our... It's just that day. Whatever stresses you out, it was that day where they just needed to go, I, I just need a rest. And that's what Jesus and his disciples were doing. So, so they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And what you need to understand is the Sea of Galilee, we'll just use the stage as kind of a, kind of the shape of the Sea of Galilee. And they were, they were here and they were getting in the boat and they were going to the other side. Well, if you've ever been to the Sea of Galilee, it's pretty easy. If you want to get from there to here, all you got to do is run. And they were so excited to hear the message of Christ that they are running along the Sea of Galilee. So when the boat landed, they were already there. When's the last time you were so excited to hear the Word of God that you actually ran somewhere? Think about that. Think about how spiritually hungry they were. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now, he didn't 
you could have probably looked and, and, and seen exactly what their physical condition was. But all he knew was they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. There are spiritually needy people out there, folks. And we need to reach out to them. As, as in, in India, um, every morning I, I would get up because the time thing is so crazy. I would wake up about 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, work, work for a little bit, and then I could go run, you know, um, trying to stay in shape. And, and, and as I was running, I, I came back and I noticed that there were um, just syringes and needles laying on the street. And whether it's here or whether it's in Northeast India, they have a drug problem. Remember I said 1.2 million baptized believers, and the gospel is making a difference. But these syringes and things, and that's a huge concern of the church in Northeast India. I could pick you up from here and take you to Northeast India and let them tell you the stories, and it's the same problems that the spiritually needy have. They are just looking and searching for something else. And we need to be about trying to give them direction and guidance through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Living together in the household of God, we have the responsibility toward God. Mark chapter 12 says it this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. I left this to the end because this is that foundation block. As 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 a church, we have the responsibility to make sure that Jesus Christ is the center, that our worship and our love of God is what it's all about. Because, you know, we, we, have, we, we label kids as having ADD, but we as a culture have ADD. We forget to focus on the main thing, and it doesn't take much to distract us, does it? We get a new job and we're lost for a while. Something happens where we're in the hospital and we just check out for a while. But we need to learn to trust and love God all the time. 24-7. Living it out. Chasing and making sure that this God that we know is the center of our life. I started early and said we need to make sure that we love God, we love others, and we see where God is at work and we go join Him. You know, there's a lot of people working in the world. There's a lot of churches up and down Route 60, Charleston, South Charleston, St. Albans, Cross Lanes, all this community. And there's a lot of people trying to reach out. I read this story from Louis Blau. Uh, actually, a sermon. It's, it's called Go to the Ends of the Earth. And, and Louis Blau is one of those people that has just traveled the world um, speaking for God and, and trying to introduce Jesus to many people. And there, here's what he wrote. My family and team have gone to over 60 countries declaring the glory of God. When I first went to the Muslim, Hindu, and Buddhist majority, majority nations, I trembled to do the right thing for the glory of God. I talked to a Hindu guru years ago and he said, and this is what's up on the screen, Luis, don't ever use the Western style of arguing. We're pretty good at that, right? Don't ever use that Western style of arguing. Trying to show your religion is better than my religion or your Savior is superior. Just simply tell who Jesus is. Tell of His character. Tell what He's like. Let people do the comparing for themselves. And that was great advice. You know, sometimes I think we feel like we have to sell Jesus. Sometimes I think we have to be able to be the smartest one in the room and be able to answer all the questions. And knowledge of God's Word and knowledge and understanding is awesome. But it is about the convicting spirit um, of what God offers. And when we do what God's called us to do, God works in crazy ways, doesn't He? You know, it's as one of the reasons that this is important to me is now that I'm at Marshall University, um, every Wednesday night when I have the opportunity to preach, there will be uh, three or four Muslims over here 
and, and four or five Hindus in the back, and, and just kind of all kinds of different religions that come in the room. Because the students at Marshall are living their lives in front of them, and every chance they get, they say, hey, come to BCM with us, come to BCM with us, come to BCM with us. There are students who meet with them at, at 10.30 on Wednesday nights to be able to look at, at God's Word and be able to explain our Jesus to them. There are people who are going um, to different homes of students from foreign countries. You know, I, I don't know if you realize this, but Marshall has an incredible international population. It's a whole lot cheaper to go to their apartment than get on a plane and go to Thailand, right? And so we're trying to figure out, as a college campus, how do we reach out to all these international students that come? And the easiest thing we figured out is that we love them and we care about them. And then we're Baptists, so we feed them. <laughs> Anything and any way that we can get into their world is what we're doing. That's the responsibility of the church. Any way that we can and follow godly principles to get involved in your community. That's the responsibility. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then when the opportunity arises, speak up. Don't hear me just saying this is all about actions and we just need to live there. At some point in time, you have to be able to tell the story. This is what Jesus did in my life. Don't need to argue. Just need to articulate your God story. This is what Jesus has done and he wants to be involved in your life. Let's pray. Father God, you have been so good to us. And God, our prayer is that we continue to seek and serve you in mighty ways. God, I just want to thank you for the blessings you've placed upon this church. God, just continue to be with them, continue to provide for them. God, continue to just be involved. Give them the courage to do what's necessary to reach out in this community. Lord Jesus, we love you and thank you. Amen. As you stand and sing, what we sing, there's a charge. Good, good Father. It is an incredible day to sing Good, Good Father. I think I can say this. One of my boys came, one of the video uh, person came back from worship last week at camp. And he goes, Wow. As all of those kids stood up to sing Good, Good Father, I just started crying. Because you know in the midst of 150 kids, there's some of those kids in there that had no concept of what a good, good father is. But our Heavenly Father is that good, good father and cares about you and cares about me and wants to be involved in your life. If you have a decision to make, Pastor Anthony's here. He'll pray with you. We'll all pray with you. But as we stand and sing, focus.